yeah welcome to the uh, series of lectures on uh, local cohomology so local cohomology so this was the notion of local cohomology was introduced by alexander uh, grothendieck in 1960s and the main motivation was to uh, answer a conjecture of p samuel about when certain types of commutative rings are unique factorization domains since then uh, local cohomology has become an indispensable and significant tool in commutative algebra and algebraic geometry so in this series of lectures we will study three equivalent definitions of local cohomology moreover we will see many properties and applications of local cohomology so we assume familiarity with basic commutative algebra uh, yeah let me write it down we assume familiarity with basic commutative algebra and basic homological algebra to understand this series of lectures uh, however we will recall each and every fact or result what we need here throughout uh, our base ring r is a it is assumed to be commutative noetherian ring with identity so without this assumption also we can define local cohomology but if we have this assumption that means base ring is commutative noetherian ring then our local cohomology it satisfies many interesting properties okay so we will assume this and we can uh, we we define local cohomology as right derived functors so uh, we need the concept of injective modules and injective resolutions for that so let me recall uh, the definition of uh, uh, injective modules so here is the definition come proposition and r module let me denote it by e is called injective if it satisfies the following equivalent conditions number 1 that the functor home blank comma e is exact that is this functor it it preserves short exact sequences i will come back to this statement later and this is equivalent to say since home functor is left exact so this is equivalent to say that for any sum module l of m every morphism every morphism from l to e it can be extended to a morphism m to e so that is in terms of diagram l is a sum module of m and it is given 
in R module homomorphism from L to E. So this uh, second statement it is saying that there exists uh, an extension map. So if it is uh, phi, if it is f, then there exists g such that this diagram is commutative. That means g compose phi, it is just f. And these two statements, they are equivalent to this. Uh, this is special case of statement 2 and we call it Bayer's criterion. What is that? So for every ideal, uh, I denote it by i less than or equal to r, uh, every ideal i of r, every morphism, r module homomorphism from i to e, it can be extended to a morphism from R to E that is again we can have same mm, diagram that it is just inclusion map and it is given an R module homomorphism from I to E then for each such map you can have an extension map so again it is there exists G okay such that in this case just restriction map on I and then that will be F. Okay. And these three statements they are equivalent to statement 4 that every short exact sequence starting with E splits. What is the meaning of that? Uh, if this map is phi and this is psi so there exists a splitting homomorphism mu from M to E such that mu compose phi it is just identity map on E. Okay. And now let me give the sketch of the proof of uh, this force uh, uh, of statements they are equivalent. So here is the proof and it is just sketch. So this functor home, uh, it, is, uh, it is always left exact. What is the meaning of that? If you consider uh, a short exact sequence like this, so this is short exact sequence, then you apply this functor on this short exact sequence to get that since it is contravariant functor it re uh, reverses the arrows okay so 0 goes to uh, from n comma e from m comma e and from l comma e okay so at these two points so at this point uh, this this point and this point it is always exact so it is exact for for any r module e but when this is exact here that means this map uh, it is induced by this map psi when this map is surjective that means we can extend it further so this is exact uh, what is same as same as uh, statement same as statement 2 why you can see it because mm, you can see in statement 2 uh, for any map from L to E you can have an extension map that means there exists G uh, such that its image is F so uh, that is G compose uh, phi it is just it is just f so this map this map it is induced by it is induced by phi it is induced by this map phi okay so this is exact uh, at this point it is equivalent to statement 2 and 
since home functor is always left exact so this is exact at right side if and only this home blank comma e is exact this is your statement one that means we have proved one if and only if two and next we can see that statement 3 it is a particular case of statement 2 right so in this case you are just considering r module r so r as module over itself and it's uh, any ideal it is sub module r sub module so any map from i to e that can be extended to a map from r to uh, e right so this is just uh, particular uh, case of this statement so 2 implies 3 it is obvious and now this direction uh, we need John's lemma it requires some proof I will skip that and next we can see that uh, 2 implies 4 so 2 implies 4 so both these statements they are easy to compute so how we can see 2 implies 4 so in this case we can write it uh, here so you just consider this uh, identity map okay and statement 2 is saying uh, statement 2 is saying that for any map uh, you can have an extension map so that means you can have this mu so there exists mu such that mu compose phi it is just identity map and this will be your split, splitting map so 2 implies 4 it is easy and now 4 implies 2 again it requires some proof I will skip that okay so thus these four statements are equivalent and an R module E satisfying uh, any of these equivalent condition uh, is called an injective R module So we should have some remark now. Suppose you have an injective module, then how can you produce many injective modules? So as remarks of the uh, above proposition, we have the following. So this is uh, one that if E is injective, that implies any localization of E. So this is localization localization uh, at localization at s where s is a multiplicatively closed subset of r this is injective s inverse r module and second remark if you consider and a family of uh, r modules so this is family of R modules this family it can be finite infinite okay so then second remark is saying that its direct uh, sum this is injective if and only if each e lambda is injective So this first remark we can prove by using uh, uh, this definition, this first one, this functor uh, is exact and we can also use the fact that localization functor uh, that is exact functor. Okay? So with combination of these two uh, statements we can prove this first remark. And uh, about second remark uh, I should note that this uh, statement, uh, this direction it is always true but for this one uh, need noetherianness of r okay and for direct product again we can have same uh, statement like this so this direct product this is injective if and only if uh, each e lambda is injective and this this is always true even you don't need noetherianness okay 
and next we shall see some examples of injective modules so for that we define uh, what we call uh, divisible module what is divisible module so an R module let me denote it by Q is called is called divisible if Q it is same as R times Q for any non-zero element in R so R for any non-zero element R uh, R times Q it is just sub module of Q but uh, if this condition so if they are equal uh, if R times Q is same as Q for any non-zero element of R we call such module as divisible module so it is kind of you can divide your module by any non-zero element of R so uh, we call such modules as divisible modules so it follows from Bayer's criterion that uh, so we will have a corollary of the first proposition uh, it says that if your base ring is a PID then and R module Q is injective if and all if sorry if and all if injective if and all if Q is divisible. So this prof proof it is just uh, use Bayer's criterion so using Bayer's criterion we can we can see that uh, this direction it is always true but uh, this one for this one you need that your base ring R should be uh, PID and the main idea is that so if your base ring is PID then every ideal is principal and then you can use your Bayer's criterion to show that injective R module if and only if that module is divisible. And now we can have some examples ok. So, first example you consider the set of integers as your base ring then uh, if you consider this z as a module over itself this is not divisible because for any non-zero integer n n times z it is just a proper sub module of z right so z is not divisible hence z is not injective as as a z module but what about uh, q and uh, q mod z so again your ring is z then if you consider both q and q mod z so here q is the set of rational numbers so then you can prove that uh, the module Q uh, as a module over as a, as a Z module it is this divisible module and same thing is true for Q mod Z so both are divisible module or divisible Z modules hence injective Z modules and in general you can have this so if your ring R is a PID then if you consider K as field of field of fractions of R so if R is Z then field of fractions of Z it is just Q set of rational numbers ok if R is polynomial ring in one variable over a field uh, then your field of fraction that will be collection of all rational function so then both k and 
K mod R, uh, they are injective R modules because they are divisible R modules, okay, and R is PID. Yeah, so thus we have in, infinitely many injective modules. In fact, every R module is contained in an injective module. So here is the uh, theorem. So this is every every R module M is contained in an injective R module. So we can give the sketch of the proof. So the main idea is that, so you can notice that Z is not injective uh, Z module, but it is contained in Q, where Q is injective Z module, right? So we can generalize this concept for any arbitrary R module. How? Uh, so here is the way. As Z modules uh, your module M it is contained in E where this E is injective Z module. So how to how to prove this statement? So we know that so anyway, this theorem, uh, it is just counterpart uh, for injective modules of the fact that every R module that is quotient of a, a projective module or free module. So that means you can have a free module F and you can have a subjective R module homomorphism from that free module to M. So your M, yeah, so this M you can think it as a free module. So if you consider it as Z module, so then this is just free Z module. It is quotient of this free Z module. So it is quotient by some sum module K. And then this uh, quotient of this free module, it is contained in the direct sum of Q modulo K, right? But since Q, uh, so it is just a direct sum of Q modulo some sum module and you can prove that this is divisible uh, Z module. So this is, you can say, so this is your E. And, and this thing is injective Z module because it is divisible Z module, okay? And next, we can observe that your R module M, it is just isomorphic to home of R comma M. Okay. So what is home of R comma M? It is collection of all R module homomorphisms from R to M. But this thing is contained in home of R comma M but as Z module. So it is collection of all Z module homomorphism from R to M. So both R and M, they are abelian group. So they are module over Z. And every R module homomorphism, that is also Z module homomorphism. Okay. So we, we can have this containment. Right. And next, we can, we can see that this is contained in home of Z of R comma E. Because M is contained in E and next you apply home of R comma this. Since home is left exact functor, so you can have this containment. Okay. And now this is an exercise that this is injective R module. So since E is an injective Z module, so you can prove that this home of R comma E over Z, this is injective R module. So that means your module M, it is contained in an injective R module. And this is the, this is the candidate. 
So we have this theorem and now using this theorem we can prove uh, another result that any R module uh, it is it has an injective resolution. So I should write it any any R module M has an injective resolution. So before that uh, I should recall uh, the definition. Okay. Definition of injective uh, resolution. So you consider an R module then a sequence or a complex I will denote it by E what is that? It is just a sequence of modules and R module homomorphisms. So 0 goes to E naught and so this is indexed by uh, so I will use superscript to denote it as Cochin complex. This complex is called an injective it is called an injective resolution of M if you can have you can have an injective map from M to E naught. Okay, so we can denote it by phi and if you attach that injective map to this complex then that means E naught goes to E1 by this phi naught phi1 phi naught phi1 this is this is an exact sequence where each EI is is an injective R module. So such complex we call as uh, injective resolution of uh, M. And now we can prove this proposition. Okay. So you start with M and this theorem it says that every R module M is contained in an injective R module. So that means this M it is contained in some injective R module and you can denote that R module as E naught. Okay. So you can have this is exact. And if you denote this uh, inclusion map as I M, so from E naught to uh, co-kernel of I M, you can have is uh, surjective R module homomorphism. Right? Now again you use this theorem. Uh, you use this theorem that any R module is contained in an injective R module. So in particular this co-kernel of I M it is contained in some injective R module. We, we, we will denote that injective R module by E1. So by uh, so combining these two maps you can have a map from E0 to E1 and we can denote it by phi0. So by construction this is exact uh, at this point. Okay, and now again we will further extend uh, this sequence by considering co kernel of phi naught. And again, this co kernel of phi naught it is contained in some injective module, let's say E2, and combining these two maps, you can have a map phi1, and by construction, again it is exact at this point. So, in this way, we, we will go till infinity okay so this is construction of injective resolution and so this gives a proof of this fact that any r module m has an injective resolution okay and now we should have some remark about injective resolution so this proposition it says existence okay and now what about uh, uniqueness what about uniqueness so this is this is remark 
that uh, first remark is that injective resolution injective injective resolutions of m uh, they are they are not they are not unique but they are they are cochain homotopy equivalent so i'll come back to this point later what is homotopy equivalent when we need this fact okay so injective resolutions of of m they are not unique but they are homotopy equivalent and if we choose this injective resolution minimally uh, but uh, okay so i should write however uh, minimal injective resolution of m is is unique up to isomorphism so what is minimal injective resolution so here uh, we chose uh, e not uh, so you can have many choices for e not okay but if you choose this e not minimally that means it is minimal injective r module uh, it is injective r module which contains m uh, and this is minimal injective r module so in each step if you choose e1 it is minimal injective r module which contains co kernel of im and minimal injective r module e2 which contains co kernel of e not uh, so in each step if you choose your injective resolution uh, injective module minimally then that resolution we call minimal injective resolution and such minimal injective resolution it is unique up to isomorphisms so any two minimal injective resolutions they are isomorphic so now we should uh, see some examples of uh, injective resolution so again we can consider this uh, your base ring is z and this module is uh, z itself it is module over itself then uh, zero goes to z goes to q it is just uh, inclusion map and goes to q mod z this is exact this is exact so uh, zero goes to q goes to q mod z goes to zero is an and we have noticed that q uh, set of rational numbers and q mod z uh, both are divisible z modules so they are injective so zero goes to q goes to q mod z goes to zero is an is an is an injective uh, resolution of z as as a, as a z module okay so in general we can have this uh, example so if your r is a pid this is a pid and again you just consider k as field of field of fractions of r then 0 goes to k goes to k mod r goes to 0 is an injective resolution of r as an r mode okay and next we will discuss i torsion functor so this is the base of local cohomology functor and then uh, we can define local cohomology functor by using this injective uh, resolution So here is the definition of I torsion functor. So we'll discuss what is functor and all.
so you consider an ideal of r and m this is just r module then define gamma i of m it is just collection of all elements of m that are annihilated by some power of i okay so this is zero for some t greater than or equal to one depending on the element x okay so this is this is a subset of m and now we can observe that uh, this is a sub module of m why because you consider two elements here x and y so suppose uh, x is annihilated by some power of i so that is i power t and y is annihilated by some power of uh, i i power s okay so then if you take the maximum of t and s then i power that that will annihilate x plus y and similarly you can you can show that uh, if x is there in this subset then any scalar multiple uh, of x it is also there in this subset okay so this subset it is closed under uh, addition and scalar multiplication and anyway it is non empty because zero is there so this gamma i of m this is just sum module of m this is sum module of m uh, and this is called this sum module is called i torsion sum module of m okay and second one that if this i torsion sum module if this i torsion sum module is the whole module m then uh, then m is called i torsion uh, module so that means each element of m it is annihilated by some power of i and if this is trivial sum module then m is called i torsion i torsion free okay i torsion free module here are some examples here are some examples so first one is that if you consider r is z and i it is just non zero uh, uh, ideal then i torsion part of it it is just zero because any element of z that is annihilated by some power of i that 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 should be trivial thing so that should be zero okay and in same way you can prove that gamma i of q it is also zero but if you consider gamma i of q mod z then what is this so this is a collection of all uh, elements of q mod z that are annihilated by some power of i and it turns out that it is just a by p power i its equivalence class where a it can be any integer okay and i it is any non negative uh, yeah integer so uh, in particular it is non zero and so this thing gamma i of q mod z uh, it is just you can think this is uh, z uh, in polynomial p power minus 1 or, or in in terms of localization you can think that this is z localized at p but modulo z okay so in particular it is a non zero uh, module so i torsion part it is non zero and next we will have one proposition that each 
each morphism, each R module homomorphism from M to N, a, it induces a morphism. This is notation gamma i of phi from gamma i of m to gamma i of n defined by defined by this restriction map of phi on gamma i of m okay so we can prove this So since restriction map, so phi is an R module homomorphism and it's since gamma i of phi we are defining in this way that it is restriction map of phi on gamma i of m. So in particular it is an R module homomorphism. Okay. So only thing we need to prove that if we restrict this map phi on gamma i of m then its image should lie in gamma i of uh, n. Okay. So it is n up to enough to show that phi image of gamma i of m it is contained in gamma i of n then we are done okay so to prove this let x belongs to x is an element of gamma i of m then x is annihilated by some power of i, let's say i power t, it annihilates x for some t greater than or equal to 1. Then you apply phi on this thing. So this is also 0 and it says i power t phi of x, it is 0. So that means phi of x, it is just element of gamma i of m. So if you restrict your map phi on gamma i of m, then it will lie in gamma i of n. So it, it gives an R module homomorphism from gamma i of m to gamma i of n. Okay. So then by using this proposition, we can have another proposition that this functor, yeah, so we can we can think it as map from gamma i of uh, yeah so we'll denote it gamma i of blank so this is from mod r to itself where mod r is just category of r modules so it associates an r module m to another r module that is just gamma i of m and not only objects it also associates each R module homomorphism. Let's say phi from M to N, it associates to an R module homomorphism that is gamma I of phi. And this is map from gamma I of M to gamma I of N. So it respects the direction of the map as well. So this is a covariant since it respects the direction of the of morphisms. So it is a covariant R linear functor. From the category of R modules to itself. Moreover, so if this is first and this is second statement, moreover, this map, this functor, it is, it is left exact, okay. So before proving this uh, proposition, uh, let me discuss what is functor. So a functor is nothing but a map from one category to another which preserves the identity morphisms and respects the composition law. And what is category? So a category is a collection of objects and maps where, uh, so uh, it is collection of objects and maps between those objects 
which satisfy uh, certain properties. Okay. So, in this case we are considering category of R modules where objects are R modules and uh, maps these are R module homomorphisms and gamma i of blank uh, we are considering it as a functor because we can associate each R module m to another uh, R module gamma i of m and each map each R module homomorphism phi we can associate a uh, another R module homomorphism we call it gamma i of phi okay and these are well defined uh, maps on objects as well as uh, collection of maps so this is a functor and we call it a covariant functor because it respects uh, the direction of the morphisms okay so we can write now so this map we can observe that if you apply this map on the identity morphism from M to itself, then its image it, it is just identity map on gamma i of M. So this is trivial observation one can have. And if you consider to yeah, so A from M to N and G from n to let's say l bo both are morphisms then you can consider their composition g compose f right and if you apply this gamma i of blank if you apply then you can prove that this is equal to gamma i of g compose gamma i of f because gamma i what uh, it, it is doing it is it, it is just considering uh, the restriction map right so you can prove this equality or you can observe very easily so that means this gamma i of blank this is a functor and it is covariant functor because it preserves the arrows and it is all linear so what is the meaning of that if you okay so let me so thus gamma i of blank is a functor and moreover it is all linear functor because if you consider two morphisms both are from m to n so then you can consider their sum and now if you apply gamma i of uh, blank then you can get gamma i of f1 plus gamma i of f2 so it preserves um, addition Moreover, it preserves scalar multiplication. Okay, so this is uh, R times gamma I of F1 for all R belongs to R. So it respects the R linear combination. So gamma I of blank is R linear. So this this thing proves your statement one. And next, we want to prove that this functor it is left exact so what is the meaning of that the meaning of uh, this statement is that if you consider a short exact sequence this is short exact sequence of r modules then apply apply gamma i of blank then what you get 0 goes to gamma i of l so this is covariant functor it preserves the arrows so if this is phi this is psi so this is gamma i of phi and gamma i of m gamma i of n and this is your gamma i of psi so then this sequence is exact so it preserves the exactness on short exact sequence in the left side so that means it is exact at this point and this point okay so this is i can write this as claim and here is the proof now since since phi is uh, injective or one one map 
so this gamma i of phi it is just restriction map on gamma i of uh, here it is l right yeah here it is l so this is also 1 1 so that means it is exact at this point now we want to prove that uh, this sequence is exact at this point so that means image of this map it is same as kernel of this map so we can use the fact that this so we have started with this short exact sequence right so that means we have this psi compose phi it is just zero and then you apply gamma i of blank to get gamma i of psi compose gamma i of phi this is zero so image of gamma i of phi it is contained in kernel of gamma i of psi okay now what about uh, equality here so what about equality here we want to prove that thing now so to prove equality here you pick something from uh, kernel of gamma i of psi and what is gamma i of psi it is just restriction map of psi right so in particular uh, it is there in the kernel of psi so psi of x it is zero and moreover x is an element of kernel of gamma i of psi so it is an element here that means it is annihilated by some power of i so i power t times x equal to zero for some t greater than or equal to one but we have started with short exact sequence so that means if something is there in the kernel of psi then it is there in the image of phi right so yeah so there exist y in l such that phi of y that is equal to x now only thing we need to prove that this y is there in gamma i of l so we can use that x is annihilated by i power uh, t so i power t phi of y it is just i power t x it is zero and that means phi of i power t y it is zero and i power t y is zero as phi is one one okay so therefore yeah thus y belongs to gamma i of l and x which is same as phi of y belongs to image of gamma i of phi and this proves equality here so this completes the proof so that means we can see that if you consider a short exact sequence and you apply your functor gamma i of blank then it is left exact so the, that sequence is left exact that means it is this sequence is exact this sequence is exact but you cannot say that this map is surjective that means uh, yeah, it need not preserve a short exact sequence to another short exact sequence okay Yeah, so we should have some example that why uh, this functor it need not be exact. Yeah, so here is the examples. So it's it is about that this functor it is. Not an exact functor in general. Okay. So you consider this short exact sequence. Uh, Z goes to Q, goes to Q mod Z. So this is short exact sequence of Z modules. And you consider your i, it is uh, some non-zero ideal of z. 
and apply gamma i of blank then 0 goes to gamma i of z goes to gamma i of q goes to gamma i of q mod z yeah this thing it is not exact why because this thing is zero that we have observed this thing is also zero but this one it is non-zero okay so you cannot have a surjective map from a zero module to a non-zero module so this thing is not exact and it shows that gamma i of blank it, it may not preserve exactness of uh, sort exact sequence okay and in the next class we will define that so let me write it in the next lecture we will define local cohomology as right derived functors of this i torsion functor and we will study various properties of it. So, I will stop here.